will be helping moderate this session um, and take it further. So, uh, we'll be uh, live on YouTube in almost. Yeah, we are live. Great. So, since this is a sensitive topic, I'll just quickly go over some ground rules or safe space norms that will be helpful for our YouTube audience as well. Shreya, if I miss anything, just help me out here. So true. first of all, obviously, whatever stays or whatever is said within the session uh, is uh, going to be quite, is going to touch upon a sensitive issue. So we need to respect each other's opinions. This is not a place for conflict. It's a place to freely express our opinions and we need to mutually respect each other's opinions. If you do appreciate what is being said, you can send in positive responses because obviously reinforcing each other is important. And anything else that Shreya you would like to add from your side? Uh, I think that covers it. Uh, every, anyone is free to express their opinions in the chat box and um, all the moderators here as well are requested to respect everyone's opinions like Chetna has already mentioned in a respectful manner. And uh, apart from that, uh, that's... So, so sorry. Yeah, so sorry. apart from that, that is it. Chetna, you can move forward. Yeah, yeah just, just give me a minute. So before we start this session to sort of uh, kick things off, we have a short video. It's a really short video clip. So I'll share my screen now. Just give me a minute. Just watch it carefully because the first question is going to be based off that video clip. Just give me a minute. Uh, is it visible? Shreya, just tell me. Yes, yes, it is. It is. it is. Just need to check the volume. <laughs> अगर माँ की निजी शारीरिक समस्याएं हों, तो बच्चे की मानसिक अवस्था और शरीर पर गहरा असर पड़ सकता है। और बाप का कोई रोल नहीं लिखा है। So that was it. Like I promised, it was a short video clip. Wait, I'll just stop sharing my screen. All right. So basically, this. Uh, ignore the middle part there. So as you see, they are in the middle of intercourse and she and the one of the partners states that they can't really feel anything. And then uh, they sort of uh, dwell into this discussion where, you know, it can have an impact on their life and uh, on their child uh, and how it's the woman's responsibility, you know, and how she's supposed to feel something during sexual intercourse. And she's not, she's not being able to do that. So my first question to you is, you are a doctor who are working in a, a primary healthcare setting and a patient presents to you with this complaint. How do you think based on the current healthcare system, what would be the approach and what are the so challenges or barriers that this person can face? So we'll start with Varisha. Am I still hey, on? Am, am I audible? Yes, yes. Yes. Um, so uh, thank you for the question, Chetna. Um, as, as the clip, you know, uh, focuses on like a very sensitive thing that like, you know, is, does happen in our society. Um, to be honest, uh, in India, especially uh, sexual and reproductive health care uh, services uh, at primary health care centers, they mostly focus only on antenatal and postnatal health care. And uh, or like family planning services and they kind of neglect uh, sexual health, which is also a part of, uh, you know, it's not just reproductive health, but it's also sexual health, which is important. And uh, the main reason that like, you know, that we, you know, we encounter such situations is because of, you know, less sensitized healthcare professionals uh, who kind of lack the knowledge to protect and like, you know, promote and provide uh, sexual and reproductive health care in the community. And, uh, you know, this uh, also any quality of health care that, you know, that is provided is also uh, deeply affected by stigma that is there around sex and sexuality. So if the health care provider itself is uh, kind of uncomfortable to discuss such topics, it kind of uh, affects uh, like the health care we provide to the particular patient. So uh, that's from uh, my side on the topic. Yeah, that was very well put, especially the last thing that, you know, if we as healthcare professionals are going to be uncomfortable discussing these subjects, how do we expect our patients to share any of their problems with us? 
So that's uh, rightly put. We'll move on to Anusha. Did I get that right? Anusha only, right? Yeah, it's Anusha. Uh, yeah. Uh, so the first thing is uh, in Indian healthcare, we consider OBG as reproductive health. We usually don't refer it to as reproductive and sexual health. That's the uh, root. I, I feel that's the first place where we need to bring the change. OBG should be reproductive and sexual health. And sex is not just for reproduction, as we all know. So it should be sexual and reproductive health. And uh, healthcare professionals have to be less judgmental when it comes to sex in the sense, irrespective of the marital status, we have to be open about the sexual history and about educating the people who come to us. Only that way, maybe we will help them in opening up to us. Definitely, definitely. I agree with everything that you said there. So we'll move on to Reina. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, you're audible. Although you're yes, visible, so have... visible. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sort of in the middle of a call right now. So I don't think I'll no, be worries. Worries. Go ahead. So I absolutely agree with what Varisha and Anu have to say about this. Uh, we need to be more open and more a, a little less judgmental about it. Uh, considering the cases that we've seen right now, I mean, even in a tertiary healthcare setup, if you see a, a, a lot of OBGYNs are, are like very judgmental about this. So I think it's it's better if we're more open and like just have a regular conversation about it to sort of like, you know, chew away the taboo for that matter. But uh, as she said, it's it's not only about reproduction. It, there's much more to it. So the only way is, I think, communication right now. Yeah, I guess the first step is to, you know, sort of dissociate uh, all care that comes under OBGYN to sexual and reproductive health care and not just reproductive health care. So we'll hear from, from Kushman now. Thank you, Chetna. Um, summing up what my colleagues already said, I think one thing we all agree is that sexual pleasure is mostly unaddressed in public health and development, as well as approaches to sexual health, probably because of assumptions that pleasure is idiosyncratic to each person's experience, right? Either without direct relevance to public health or its objectives, or because sexual pleasure is basically seen as a potentially uncontrollable motivation for behaviors associated with the risk of STIs in pregnancy. This is, these basic two assumptions make us, you know, uh, unaddress or ignore the importance of sexual pleasure to sexual health and development. And that is one of the reasons why um, both the patient as well as the provider consider it as an unimportant or non-relevant non part of, you know, history as well as um, the discussions that happen between a patient and a provider. In, um, in, in relevance to their sexual health. And that is the reason why it is um, currently one of the most unaddressed topics within the Indian healthcare system. And, and, and to be honest, if, if I am a doctor and a, and a patient comes to me in a PHC, I'm not sure even if a patient would come. If they would, there will be probably a, you know, um, an unwanted bias or awkwardness surrounding the topic that it will be very difficult um, to cross and have a comfortable discussion around it, yeah. Not to mention that, you know, the presence of the partner and the whole interaction around this topic will create further challenges for the doctor to sort of first identify what the problem is because they might not directly tell you what exactly is going on. So that's another challenge that, you know, may be there. So with that, I'll hand over to Shreya for the next question, Shreya. Uh, so, hi. So, um, Avik, would you like to add anything? Yes. Uh, thank you, Shreya. Am I audible? Yeah, yeah. With your uh, permission, I'd like to rephrase the question. Uh, would she receive any healthcare at all? That's, that's a more relevant point to add. I think uh, with respect to our rural and our urban healthcare system, uh, sexual pleasure, especially female sexual pleasure, is not given importance because, as you know, uh, women don't need to orgasm to have kids, right? So that's why uh, we often uh, look at health in general and sexual reproductive health from a very objective point of view. But as we all know, it is, it's all a spectrum. It's always very subjective. 
plus like uh, like with all my respective colleagues with you know what they added i think uh, perhaps the patient herself or himself would be you know like uh, very hesitant and you know or even afraid to to, to come to a doctor and ask for you know like advice on sexual pleasure and i think uh, if you and patients don't usually come alone right they you know, they usually have a, a a guardian a parent like whatever accompanying them right and in front of them there's absolutely no chance that he or she is going to be addressing it i think the way forward would be i think like you know we need sex ed- education or sre from a very fundamental mm-hmm. at the primary not primary maybe like in secondary school level and especially even with a medical curriculum because we still consider homosexuality as a sexual perversion right so even in our own books uh, things are wrong rather even when the, the american psychiatric association and other organizations have clearly stated that it is not but we still have to write those answers in the exam right so yeah so i i, I think it will be a big challenge to for dolly to get healthcare at all in, in a village setting at a phc thank you yeah that's actually really well said and whatever you are saying about education actually merges really well into the next question that i have for the uh, table here so basically i wanted to ask as healthcare professionals what are some of the major challenges you think uh, you will face in educating individuals in the rural population for example phcs what are some of the major challenges you would face so um kushman would you like to go first yes I think um, this again brings us to the first point that is very important is the stigma as Varisha had mentioned um, in the first answer that stigma surrounding uh, sexual pleasure in particular you know be it a rural setting or, or be it an urban healthcare setting is is huge is is something that is even prevalent uh, within medical students itself you know something that's not even a comfortable discussion uh, between medical students. um and that is a that is one major problem discussing about aspects of you know um sexual pleasure such as masturbation orgasm is something that needs to be normalized to help them understand how important it is um you know for the sexual health so that is that is one major i would say barrier to a healthcare professional because it is important to first equip yourself uh with with the understanding and remove the stigma and biases that surround you as you know in your since as a medical professional the stigma and biases that are present in my colleagues itself you know before progressing further to addressing the the patients the general public in the rural healthcare settings because once you understand it is normal to discuss about sexual pleasure it is normal uh, to you know have uh, complaints regarding that and it's something that does not need to be under the cover or under the rug and something that can you know be openly discussed between your fraternity and that fraternity and the change starts from within and that is from where the change starts once the medical fraternity starts feeling comfortable with it i think um the first change is made and that that is how to proceed further yeah definitely i think the change starts from us and which is why this conversation is so very important so uh, moving on uh, reena um Oh, I absolutely agree that the change starts from within. So once we are openly discussing about this amongst ourselves, I think uh, the guard, like the next step, would be to uh, make the patient a little more comfortable when the when they just enter, not to make like a bias in the first the first five minutes when you know you're you're just uh, just seeing how the patient is walking in, like assuming all the things that would the, that would be the issue. so uh, regarding that it is important to make the patient comfortable enough for the patient to actually speak about any of this and uh, yeah any of this and like you can openly discuss about this so is i have seen like i've seen a couple of uh, gynae cases where a lot of obgyns don't really discuss this don't even like utter the utter any of the sexual pleasurable things if you see the patient is unmarried for some reason and uh, that's something that needs to this appeal from rn for them to openly talk about it that's that's how we would at least start addressing the issue yes definitely i agree with what you're saying so um varsha would you like to go next yes uh, so uh, like you know i would actually summarize this in just like one word that uh, you know um krishnan mentioned that is stigma uh, because in rural setting people feel like talking uh, anything re- related to sex is very personal and something that should stay between the four walls 
and uh, they feel that it's like talking to a doctor about it is like unnecessary and not needed and um, there are actually a lot of predisposing factors to this like in rural india young women they are at a high risk of uh, sexual reproductive health outcomes because you know early marriage or you know lack of sexual and reproductive health knowledge or like you know their limited capacity to actually negotiate in a sexual relationship signs of a limit or um, accessibility to sexual health so the existing taboo it has affected young or uh, you know sexually active individuals to actually approach healthcare professionals uh, related to sex topics so yeah Like so that. yeah definitely i think that there is a very different dynamic in the rural versus the urban population which needs to be addressed and that's one of the major barriers so moving on anusha yes uh, so as most of our colleagues mentioned this is a two phase thing it includes both the doctor and the patient both have to be trained in this aspect i think most of uh, like we discussed about how with the patients the taboo and the stigma around the topic with the patients but the other thing that has to be addressed is how we doctors perceive the pleasure uh, what i mean by that is in textbooks when we study we do not discuss the pleasure aspect of sex we discuss about sexual dysfunction we uh, discuss about normal sexual activities and some things which are, we consider as uh, pervert things but we do not discuss something anything about pleasure or what induces pleasure and how you can uh, you know if a patient comes to you with a complaint then how do you address it how you ask history about pleasure that is the first place where we as uh, medical professionals have a hurdle in this aspect yes definitely i feel like you know just dissociating like has been mentioned all the term, like throughout that dissociating sex from reproduction is very important in addressing pleasure so um moving on a week yes i'd like to add like you know everyone already mentioned most of the points but i'd like to add one uh, actually contradictory thing that i came up with uh, you know actually rural women are having sex at a younger age than urban women in in rural india like uh, women usually have sex at 17 or 18 whereas in urban india it is around 21 to 22 right so people are having sex that is and they are, they are having extramarital sex so like so the the problem is in the taboo that is associated with it and i think with regard to uh, the amount of misinformation that is there and and the amount and the lack of education that that's there it's it's very difficult to go and educate them i'd like to cite an instance if i have the time like i have a, like a, like i have a cousin brother who's a, who's a doctor and he went uh, to a village and and they were talking about you know, how to use condoms right so so they so they used a bamboo stick and and like you know, and and he said you put the condom on the bamboo stick while having intercourse right and after 6 7 months when he went there again then he realized people are both getting pregnant and they were not and they were not using condoms because they were putting the condom on the bamboo stick and and having intercourse like they didn't understand that you had to like you had to put the condom on your penis right so that's the amount of that's the uh, you know that's the misinformation and the lack of education that we have so i think it we need to permeate sexual uh, uh, sexual education at the primary level and also like at the phc i think we need more uh, you know women doctors because uh because uh, you know like female doctors usually don't uh go in in the phcs right right and and it's 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 a big struggle for, for especially for, for you know for, for females to come up uh, and share their struggles with male doctors so that is again a issue i think we need to like address yeah definitely definitely and i mean that was actually a really good story that you mentioned it's funny but it just summarizes everything that we have spoken about so uh, moving on um now um, as we all know even in our um, medical curriculum we aren't taught much about the lgbtqia plus community and um, usually the conversations we have in the healthcare setting are steered in a heteronormative direction so what do you think as healthcare professionals we can do to blurry this binary and uh, have a more or open conversation about uh, the pleasure and lgbtqia community in, in the lgbtqia context so um uh, dr reena would you like to go first hi so uh, again the same thing it's it is about making the person comfortable but it's also about you widening your horizon and taking everything into consideration and then like asking for like certain questions that you know you have to like go through you don't have to just 
account for like a male female or something like that you have to like you know widen your horizon at this point because come on this is like we're living in like 2021 right now and you know that things like this if we do not openly talk about it i don't think anyone else would like want to or even like be comfortable enough to address this so i think it starts from us about addressing this or uh, talk to them about okay who they are uh, refer to them as their partner at this point instead of just like you know putting them in a box instead of that think out of the box or uh, address them as okay or uh, how are things going on with your partner for that manner so they are comfortable enough to talk no matter who he or she is and uh, then go about with the whole sex the sexual pleasure things and i think that's that's what it starts with and then address their issues you know whatever issues they are having at this point it doesn't i mean again sex is not about reproduction so no matter what or whoever their partner is or there has to be some amount of sexual pleasure in the relationship that they are in yes definitely i feel like sexual pleasure is a necessity and that should be addressed so uh, moving on barisha yes so uh, i think we can on future healthcare providers because you know we have access to equip them with the knowledge and skills and you know how to advocate about uh, you know sexual and reproductive health and right uh right related to lgbtqia plus community and uh, in this approach the most important thing that we to you know kind of uh, that we need to conceptualize is the sex positive approach because we as future healthcare providers or uh, you know must believe that sex isn't something to be you know embarrassed about or ashamed about and you know we should promote a positive attitude to sex and you know respect others sexual preference so i think that's where it starts and you know as you know uh, we know that you know this is a concept which is not taught in our textbooks or in our curriculum so uh, as you know medical student organizations we are stakeholders of you know advocating uh, future healthcare providers you know yes definitely and like you know i think of we already mentioned that people are having sex it's not like it's not happening we just need to start the conversation and be more open about it so kushman would you like to go next yes i think adding on to what my colleagues already added is that understanding the linking of sexual pleasure to sexual rights and sexual health based in you know one word i'll use is respecting respecting any person you know um whether it it's non binary or a binary um rights and self determination their right to consent safety practice privacy confidence and communication as well as the ability to negotiate one thing that we under, we need to understand is that we need to respect someone's decisions in these forums what happens is we try to overstep those boundaries while advising you know while it is it is important to have an open conversation it is important to understand and respect someone's choices in these fields and it is very important that is where you know it we will be able to blur the differences when we will will stop um stop over advising or stop judging you know i think um, one thing i've seen is if somebody tries to open up a conversation it it dies down because they did not get a response or you know they were over advised or they were negatively advised on the scene negatively advised to discuss or they were over advised in the sense that they felt somewhere in their rights uh, were you know violated so one thing we need to make sure is while we are addressing or you know we are discussing is we respect these boundaries and that is when uh, an open discussion and a safe discussion will happen and you know uh, yeah that would it be yeah definitely i feel like uh, we as healthcare professionals need to be more trained in how we can advise appropriately rather than just advise and you know just enough instead of just you know continuously talking about whatever it is that we know about so um so next uh, anusha would you like to go next uh yes uh, just as the kushman just mentioned uh, we have to stop uh, you know Uh, over advising or not reciprocating or not leading to a conversation we have to reduce doing that uh, what i would like to add is uh, when we study in our textbooks we uh, refer to transgender as a dysmorphia 
we refer to transgender as a sex differentiation disorder these words in itself put a sense of disrespect within our community we fail to recognize that these are normal so when we fail to recognize it as normal we do not treat them as normal we treat it as a disorder so when the patient comes to us they are patients they are not a disorder that we have to realize first and also our textbooks say anything other than vaginal intercourse is something perverse that's what our forensic textbooks always mention so this also has to be changed only then will we be able to accept things which are outside the box as normal or else anything outside the box will look like abnormal and we will start over advising our patients or stopping the conversation yes definitely i feel like the changing the dialogue especially like in our medical textbooks itself we first need to change the wordings that we are utilizing today so avik would you like to go next yes like uh, there is this quote with great power comes great responsibility right so i think the onus is on the healthcare professional doctors because we have the power we have the power to spread correct information we have the power to help them we have the power to you know like normalize sexual pleasure and lgbtq population right i think what kushwan brilliantly said like you know we need to there's a fine line between advising and and intruding right we need to get to that and i think you know a lot of us already have a lot of prejudices like we, no one can deny that right but i think in spite of having those prejudices you first of all you need to unlearn them okay and even if you can't even if you can't unlearn those those prejudices you need to make you need to like at least find yourself a space where where you'll be able to treat a, a person and not judge him or her right or they or them right and you need to just and you just need to see a patient as a human being and not as a case right and with respect to and, and like what also a lot of my colleagues said that the the terminology needs to change like you know we had gender incongruence and then gender dysphoria and and these these multiple uh, uh, names and terminologies have already been debunked right so I, so i think like a, a lot of the, the the population still you know like still haven't had you know didn't come to terms with it but as doctors we have because people trust us right we we are still one of the most trusted professional communities because we have the power we need to spread the correct information we need to create a safe space that is our responsibility because we have the power with, with respect to lgbtq population or or any or or any sexual and reproductive health patient that is coming to us Uh, definitely and to quote spider man i guess with great responsibility comes great power so um moving on or uh, chetna can take over now yeah i think a few things that were brought out is there's a socio cultural context to sex and pleasure you know like we can talk about how sex needs how sex can be pleasurable like but like kushman said there are boundaries and i think a lot of our colleagues said that there are boundaries to what level we can take this conversation to with or respect to the comfort of our patient because ultimately even though we might be open to the issue our patients might not be keeping this in mind i put forward my next question now we spoke about how sex should be linked to pleasure so as doctors you are equipped with the knowledge you understand this but how do you feel it will influence the patients and how do you feel it will it will influence the incidence or you know or uh, the presentation of sexual dysfunction in a healthcare setting so we'll start with uh, rena oh, hi i'm sorry i didn't quite get your uh, question so again as a doctor you're equipped with the knowledge and you understand sexual pleasure right but how do you sort of uh, like how do you how does that in your opinion influence your patients or how does that influence the healthcare setting because the patient's knowledge or acceptability might not be at the same level as you right so basic yeah. essence of the question is that okay so i think again uh, the whole thing is about uh, addressing the issue that the patient has in the uh, initial 5 uh, minutes and then sort of like talking about it and figuring out what sort of a the providing a space uh, of safe space to the patient to like get to know about you know what his or her boundaries are and uh, probably like uh, you know asking and respecting his boundaries and then like you know asking like for his permission to discuss this further or if he, he or she wants to discuss this and then moving ahead with 
whatever and like you know sort of advising that you know you could like stop at any given point that the patient feels uncomfortable because i mean everyone has different boundaries towards this and like something that i am i would be ready to accept you might not be so that is something that again i mean it's it's about how open the patient is about all of this to you as a healthcare professional and then moving ahead uh anusha speaking uh first thing is what we have learned we need to um, uh, you know impart it in the general public that is how we can uh, op- make them open up to us uh and uh, yeah i would agree with what dr reina was just telling all right kushman okay i think i'll i'll go back to my basics here basics of history taking and clinical examination here while i well i discuss the answer so one thing is um when a patient comes to me um i need to ensure that the patient feels comfortable to speak up you know one thing we are really taught in the history is we have to make sure that the patient speaks their mind out first before we start asking them leading questions right so in this case if it's a case of a sexual dysfunction and i have figured it out initially from the chief complaint i need to make sure that you know there's no warning signs let's say a patient has an attendant whom patient is not really comfortable to talk in front of i need to you know take it as a, an onus on myself that uh, i need to talk in private with the patient um or you know examine the patient so the attendant may take a leave for a first few minutes and then start off on the conversation and how the conversation should start is the doctor being the listener for the first few you know minutes until the patient doesn't stop you know listen for the first 20 minutes to decipher what information the patient is ready to give to the doctor and how comfortable the patient is second is very important to empathize looking eye to eye with the patient and empathizing with what what the patient is trying to explain that's where you get into the third phase of confidentiality you know now that it's in safe space you are com- you will feel comfortable enough to ask a few questions to the patient post consent if they would be willing to answer and it is not important to force something it's always you know you should start off small by asking patient that if you're comfortable you can answer this question if you aren't you cannot you know if let's say uh, we are able to decipher at least some part of it some part of what the problem patient is currently facing second thing is we need to understand and you know try to explain them what is the correct method rather than telling them that what they did was wrong it is important to explain them that what is right you know rather than directly judging them or um, telling them that you know this should not be done or uh, this they should never repeat this if they do not want such problems rather it's better as a week already mentioned that it happens everywhere you know everyone um has sex a uh, sexual issues it's important to explain them what is right rather than you know judging their problems into right or wrong you know focusing on what is right will help the patient understand and even try to accept what the doctor is telling if the patient is comfortable as described in the previous setting so that would be my approach that was very well put and very detailed thank you so varisha your take on this yes uh, so i think kushman uh, kind of summarized each point very very well um uh, because uh, all the points that she mentioned is uh, how you create a safe space with your patient which is very important uh, because until unless the, you respect their boundaries and what they want to you know convey and what they are comfortable in saying uh, you won't be able to get the appropriate history and it will just lead to false history that is very commonly seen in our hospitals so uh, you know uh, i think that's all about it and uh, related to uh, sexual dysfunction that like you know chitra mentioned that how do we detect uh, the incidence of such issues actually the conversation around sexual pleasure can maybe decrease the cases of you know sexual dysfunction related issues because if you know people start getting into such conversations they might also start discussing its possible solutions and treatments so you know uh, many of these go undetected because lack of uh, awareness in sexual health so yeah that's from my side 
So yeah, I think a point that Varusha brought out there and what I was trying to go with for the question and probably didn't come through is that, you know, if we do have conversations about sexual pleasure, people will realize that, you know, sex is supposed to be a pleasurable experience. And if that is not happening and if that is not what they're experiencing, maybe somewhere down the line, you know, they will realize that, okay, this is not what should be happening and they might present to healthcare and that might eventually bring down the incidence. So with that, I'll hand over to Shreya. So, hi. So I think it was all summarized really beautifully. I feel like the takeaway is that, you know, sexual pleasure is not optional. It is a com it is compulsory for both or any party involved in um, a sexual relationship. So uh, moving on to the next question, what do you think as um, healthcare professionals are the primary steps um, that need to be taken to increase the acceptability towards uh, sexual pleasure as a part of sexual health. Uh, so, sorry. <laughs> so, um, Kushman, would you like to go first? Okay. I think I answered part of this question uh, too much uh, uh, in my last answer. So, I'll try to keep this one short. Um, it's basically um, a few things I would like to mention. Adequate patient education, um, comfortability and consent, and a doctor-patient privacy uh, would be the, one of the three major features. You know, let's say one patient, even if one patient has a comfortable experience with a doctor, um, word of mouth spreads fast, right? Uh, people are comfortable with their peers, with, within their family. If somebody had faced an issue and they felt comfortable, you know, they, they felt the problem resolved while talking to one doctor, they'll be probably recommending someone else to, you know, go have a similar discussion with the doctor. And that is how an exponential change can happen. You know, if, even if a few couple of doctors start practicing in such a manner, um, it, can lead, it can lead to increased discussions very, very fast because these problems are very common and they have very less, you know, um, solutions because people don't go to the doctor itself. Yeah, like I feel like one thing that I have noticed is that the most successful gynecologists, or you know, to put it in very plain terms, gynecologists who earn the most, they possibly are the most open minded ones and the ones who address such issues in their healthcare setting. So, um, Avik, would you like to um, add on? Yes, yeah, uh, Pushman, lovely points again. Uh, yeah, like she said, like we need to build the rapo first, and our consultation should be that of inclusion and not of exclusion, right? And also, I think uh, with respect to the misinformation that is spread, I th there are multiple uh, 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 recognized profiles on Instagram who preach unscientific things like semen retention and this and that and whatnot, and 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 like they preach sex as if it's in it's some sort of a perversion or you know like a like how to put it like it's 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 you know, it degrades you or something okay and there are multiple celebrities per se who preach all of these things and i think the second point is that he, i think we need to like uh, tell people that you know like having sex also you know, uh, like uh, it, it has multiple benefits like like for example it it boosts the immune system uh, it uh, and it boosts your libido which improves uh, sleep and uh, de stress and mental health it improves uh, bladder control for women uh, it lowers blood pressure. It is counted as exercise, and uh, it uh, it uh, it lowers the risk of, of ischemic heart disease or or heart attacks. It it reduces endorphins and and you know, lessens pain, and makes prostate cancer less likely. In that case, even masturbation makes prostate cancer less likely. So the stigma is is there, and and it is widespread, and and people are giving it uh, newer uh, shapes and newer forms, and they are teaching these things and very very unsci unscientific things. I think, uh, you know, like with respect to the patients, they don't know where to go. For example, like if like if a guy has a sexual problem, which doctor to go, people don't know that people go to those quacks, like sexologists and stuff, and they don't know what they're doing. Right. Okay. So, and, and like, till maybe like, you know, like a few days back, I didn't know that you have to go to a urologist for a male sexual health problem. And as we all know, you no, know, like OBGYNs are not really very friendly. Like you can't even like in the hospitals, you can't even ask openly, are you sexually active? You have to ask, like, you know, are you married or not? That is the level of, uh, you know, like uh, stigma that is associated with it. So I think uh, it change comes from, comes from us, but also I think we need to tackle the misinformation that, that is being spread. And, you know, like, and, and this is a fundamental thing, right? Because, because as you all know, 
people are having sex and but but you know people still have that taboo right so they have not been to speak open or openly about it and 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 these people are taking advantage of that people are making money out of that teaching the wrong things right so and 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 patients don't know where to go so they are suffering and 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 so, and, and and with respect to sexual dysfunction it adds up to your mental health problems anxiety and you know feeling of inadequacy and also like you know like i said multiple health benefits are there so we need to like dissociate sex from uh, re- reproduction and you know, and make it more about pleasure and it's a beautiful thing and we should all you know i, I think it's a very for me it's, it's a very holy thing or a very pious thing because you know like uh, in that matter so yeah that, that that's what i think like we need to like stop misinformation and be more open to these conversations Yeah, definitely, and I think one point that really hits home is that the first thing we need to do when we're taking history is stop asking the patients if they're married or not in replacement for sexual history, because I just I find that a little funny, but it is also a little sad. So, um, yeah, Shreya, last point for the next uh, two questions or the next couple of questions, uh, Shreya uh, will be answering for me, my friend and colleague Shreya, and she'll uh, be the panelist for DFC for the next. So that's not an issue. This is actually the last question that we have for today. Okay. Second, second last. We have oh, one. sorry, second last. Okay, the last question. Shia will. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So, Anusha. Yeah. Uh, so first, I would like to address the point which uh, uh, Avik and also Shreya mentioned. That is, uh, OBGYNs asking about uh, marital history. uh i would like to say that uh, it's not just to put the pa- patient at ease but or the obgyn at ease sometimes it's about the safety of the doctor when we are asking this question uh so when we sit in the clinic or in the opd uh if it is a primary health setup or if it's a rural setup if we directly ask them about their sexual history we can be sure about that we are getting uh, you know some kind of violence or some kind of backlash due to that question because this is a very common thing like i can give an example of my own uh, you know when i was in a phc and uh, when i asked a uh, uh, you know young girl who had recurrent uti about her sexual history she looked at me with such a fear space in that she is not married and i knew that uh, i could get a backlash out of that i mean so we have to be safe also so until and unless our society is open about this we as doctors cannot force them to be open about it we'll have to respect their boundary with respect to asking the history if they are comfortable with calling it as uh, either married or uh, not if they are or if they are uh, comfortable with uh, saying it as they are sexually active or not we have to make sure about that we directly as obgyn we cannot ask them are you sexually active so that's the one thing and uh, yeah so uh, for uh, the question that shreya asked i feel uh, just to put it in a sentence it's dissociate sex from reproduction that is the main thing that we need to do and also better sex education uh, which has to be included under public health so uh, we include immunization why can't we include sexual health ed- i mean sexual education only if we include sexual education will people be aware that it is not something they have to treat as a taboo and they can come to the hospital stating that they have they are sexually active and they don't have to come to us telling that they are married so it has to be uh, addressed as an education thing rather than uh, you know putting it on the doctor sometimes we have to play it safe also yeah definitely actually that makes a lot of sense because i myself haven't really asked the patient for fear of their reaction you know that you know what how will they react what will they say maybe you know you ask them this question and then they close off completely and then they stop giving you the history so yeah that completely makes sense i guess we have to tailor our expectations according to the patient so yes definitely uh, sorry uh, to uh, sorry to interrupt shreya it's not just them closing up i mean not just them stopping answering our questions it's also about uh, the you know the chance of violence that can happen against us especially in rural setup because you question you are the only doctor there you question then the whole village can turn against you that is also a possibility when you are in a phc yeah definitely and since considering that there have been instances of violence that is a very valid that is a very valid point that you have put out there so um moving on varsha yes uh, so i think the first thing here is to you know kind of advocate for srhr as you know future healthcare professionals 
and to kind of impart comprehensive sexuality education because that kind of lacks in our society and uh, far away from kind of getting into our curriculum. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, and uh, I would actually take this platform to actually share this uh, amazing tool that is used to, uh, you know, kind of assess sexual pleasure. Uh, this tool has been uh, uh, used uh, by uh, GAB, uh, which is called the GAB Triangle Approach, which kind of links sexual health, sexuality, and sexual pleasure. And uh, this is the tool which kind of, you know, uh, can be used by healthcare providers to, uh, you know, um, get closer uh, in communication with their patients and kind of assess uh, what their needs are in a relationship, in a sexual relationship with their partner and, you know, what are their needs and where are they lacking. And it's kind of like a self-reflection that the patient kind of assesses. So, uh, like, building capacities of healthcare providers to, you know, uh, and access to such tools can actually help them uh, in creating conversations with their patients. So, yeah. Yeah, definitely. A needs-based assessment when it comes to uh, sexual pleasure is something that is of preliminary importance. So, Reina. Oh, I absolutely agree with what Varisha had to say. And uh, even Anusha about the whole uh, married and unmarried thing, I mean, it, it, it pretty much makes sense because, I mean, towards the end of the day, I mean, there is a lot of violence against doctors and that is the only way to address it. Uh, but I think after probably asking about like them, their marital status, maybe you can figure out in the next few minutes of talking whether the patient would be comfortable or uncomfortable talking about their sexual activity and then moving ahead with it rather than just starting off by asking about sexual activities because the, the patient will be taken aback because I'm pretty sure 80% of the doctors in our country don't usually ask them that. So that is not something that they're used to. They're used to about... Uh, that being used to about asked about okay married unmarried and all of that. Also uh, about what Avik had to say about the whole uh, misinformation bit. I think it is time we address it, even if it's in bits and pieces. Even if the patient doesn't really ask for it, I mean to address like a few of those things might make the might might make the patient a little more open towards like you know asking about any issues that they might have. And also about reassuring the patient that they can come back to you with any issues regarding to this. It doesn't really have to be like, like a pathological disease. It doesn't have to be a UPI or anything related to that, but I can come back for any of the sexual pleasure related things. That is something that not a lot of doctors reassure them. So that's, yeah, that's my opinion. All right, that's great. So I absolutely agree with everyone, what everyone has said and some everyone has put up very fabulous points and facts. So I'll be handing it over to Chetna now. So yeah, so this is the last question of the day and a sort of concluding statement. So you all are here representing your organizations and you all have spoken about advocating for SRHR. So we'll go around hearing from you what the takeaway is for your organization and your advocacy campaigns from this discussion because at the end of the day that's the whole point of this platform and of having these discussions so we'll go with kushman thank you chetna um i'd like to congratulate team semsa um for beautifully moderating this discussion as well as bringing forth this topic um during this month as well as to the team bfc for organizing these wonderful round tables um, our takeaways as an organization for our advocacy campaigns from um, this specific session would be, you know, increasing or improvising on the existing campaigns to include um, more actively uh, the topic of sexual pleasure uh, as well as more comfortably within the medical fraternity first, educating as many members as we can um, regarding say if ways to address the topic, as well as educating their peers and even the general public, you know, that would be the first step. Second um, is one thing I've realized is that there's a lack of adequate policy steps um, regarding sexual pleasure in sexual health, um, as well as sexual rights whenever, whenever there's a discussion on. So something that we'll be working on with our public health and research department is to actually add actively research and advocate to the policy makers for inclusion of this topic of sexual pleasure, as well as the issue of sexual pleasure with 
when talking about or when address, um sexual health as well as sexual rights for the public yeah that would be the two major takeaways for us thank you so much. thank you so much for all your wonderful answers including that last concluding statement so with that we'll move on to reena oh i love how beautifully krishna has put it together like both the points i agree this is something that i was about to touch on but uh, i would like to come last day at like team or dfc and semsa i mean the moment i saw the message about this topic i mean i i had to tell a gaja that okay i want to go for this because this is something that not like has that has not been discussed uh, i mean not in such depth till now at least amongst the medical organization yet so um, i was absolutely stunned when you all picked this topic up or uh, yeah i mean uh, coming back to the point the takeaway would be that uh, we as uh, med- the medical fraternity like at least the future needs to talk about this and needs to be open amongst ourselves to make sure that we are open with the patient and like creating sort of a safe, a safe space for them to discuss this and also address the the misinformation related to this and regarding about the whole rural health setup it is it is still a taboo amongst them even though they are they are sexually active at a younger age they still do not know how to go about with it at least the females it's also about empowering the females uh, like letting them know that there is something as female sexual pleasure and it is a thing even though you do not have to like it's not a part of reproduction but it is there and that is what you need to experience so yeah about that and it's it's all about communication <laughs> thank you so much so we'll uh, move on varisha yes uh firstly i would like to congratulate team simsa and uh, dfc for this wonderfully put up uh, panel uh, because this is a topic which uh, it's high time we discuss about it because uh, it's important that we initiate these conversations as uh, future future healthcare providers uh, and i say actually believe in a uh, kind of advocating for srhr and we have done our webinars and uh, uh, workshops on a uh, kind of uh, imparting knowledge on sexual pleasure and how future healthcare providers should have a take on it and we will continue to do so with you know collaborating with relevant stakeholders and uh, on how uh, to better communicate with uh, you know on such topics with our patients because uh, this is the first step to uh, you know kind of breaking the ice and kind of initiating the conversation starting it with healthcare professionals and then expanding it and uh, you know creating a safe space with your patients so yeah. that's great to hear that you're going to continue your already wonderful efforts firstly and you know secondly the fact that you said that this is the first step you know this is our starting point and we need to keep on building the foundation and i think that's what all of us are doing and that's really great so next we'll go with shreya hello am i am i audible yes yes yeah so first of all i would like to applaud samsa for i uh, suggesting such a wonderful and relevant topic for this session and um to answer your question um uh, personally what i felt is uh, for personally the takeaway for me was the importance of a code of conduct for the healthcare professionals on the importance of a code of conduct on how to deal with a patient who's approaching them especially in a rural setting with problems related to sexual pleasure and libido because for most healthcare professionals this is like not a medical issue and true it's not it's it isn't always a medical issue it does not always have a pathological basis but the code of conduct should emphasize on not dismissing problems like this as something humorous something amusing something that is made up something that does not require further investigation and uh, as a representative of dfc i am proud to say that dfc has a special task force Uh, dedicated to sexual and reproductive health and has time and again raised issues regarding sexual pleasure and the impact that it has on the overall quality of a, like of quality of life of an individual so my take away for this and for dfc would be in increasing the awareness regarding the importance the relevance of sexual pleasure and libido as a part of sexual well-being as a part of the overall health of an individual and not just something that can be sidelined 
as a adjunctive to overall so that's it thank you yeah i really think you've captured the essence there with you know sort of coming up with a code of conduct that can be used in rural settings with respect to sexual pleasure because i think that's a lot of what we're shifting at dfc and what dfc tries to do so again and obviously the dedicated uh, task force their work is wonderful as well so anusha would you like to go next yeah uh thank you chetana and shreya uh and also uh, simsa and uh, dfc for giving us this platform um yeah i, I would also like to uh, extend my gratitude to clinicase for uh, giving me the opportunity to attend this round table conference uh being from the community health wing of uh, clinicase uh, when we conduct our health camps uh, spe especially the swasth bharat camps Uh, we come across women uh, who have complaints uh, regarding their sexual health and also regarding uh, contraceptive uses their difficulty in convincing their partners with contraceptive uses and such issues and uh, this was a good platform where we could discuss on how to approach our pa patients how to make them comfortable and uh, for clinic case i think our takeaway would be that um, we need to help our uh, uh, you know underprivileged and rural public uh that coming to the doctors about their sexual history or reproductive history or contraceptive history it's not a taboo it's not a stigma so as a community healthcare wing we have to educate uh people that come under our wing uh and also in women we have to dis i mean we have to teach them that discussion about sex is not a question about their character and uh, in men discussion about sex is not a question about their manhood so this is something we need as a community healthcare wing we need to focus on and uh, through clinicase uh, when it comes to our professional wing i think we have to uh, conduct sessions and educate our uh, volunteers and our doctors uh, how to approach patients when it comes to these aspects so uh, i would like to thank you all for this yeah i really think what you said about dissociating the concept you know that so, talking about sex is somehow questioning someone's character questioning their femininity questioning their masculinity that is very important and i'm really glad that you know you have such ideology and you are going to implement it in your community healthcare wing so i'm really glad to hear that so before we conclude shreya what do you think our takeaway at simsa is going to be from this discussion because at the end of the day, at the end of the day it's for our benefit as well right uh so basically um like you know from the discussion we had and from the insights that we gained we asked questions coming in with a little bit of knowledge and you know we gained more insights than um we actually expected so you know the thing is that you know as a uh, council on focused on sexual and reproductive health rights health and um, rights um i feel like the first thing um you know again the code of conduct and um, you know creating more events that are inclusive not only when i'm speaking of inclusivity i don't just speak of the lgbtqi community but being more inclusive of the fact that you know sexual pleasure exists and it's a necessity to our biology i would say and um, you know we would want to focus more in the future on this aspect and you know try and address it and try and destigmatize the topic in, as a as a whole so um i think that is our um, that is my main takeaway sheet my anything you would like to add and just that this platform is so amazing and to see all of your passion for advocacy for fostering a safer space in healthcare because at the end of the day that is our aim right and it is amazing and i'm really glad that i got to host that i got to host this discussion on behalf of simsa today and it's an amazing platform really so i think that's it from our side a week yes uh thank you simsa for hosting this lovely session i think uh, our thoughts and words will uh, translate into actions in the future and uh, uh we will make sure that we like all the respective organizations actually to you no know, like practice what you preach and try to help as many people as as possible and um, yeah we need to click a picture uh, yes wait uh, arushi can you click a screenshot or something like uh, everyone please uh, please like show your beautiful faces please uh, <laughs> need to click a picture we all want promotion right yes done okay I think we are done. Thank you. We can disperse. Good night.
Good night. night. Thank you so much. Good night. Good night, guys. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye-bye.